We, um, if we have not met, my name is Shane, and I'm the lead pastor here at MVF Church, and I get the privilege of sharing God's word with you today. And we want everyone to know, no matter where you come from, what your background is, uh, we want this to be a safe, comfortable place for you to hear and learn more about what it means to walk with God. And so we want to be a part of that journey with you. So thank you for coming today and being a part with us. We're actually in the third week of a series called Building a Vision, and we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. Um, if you, if you want to turn there with us and follow along, would love to have you do that, welcome you to do that um, in your Bibles or on your phones. If you're new with us, don't know if you know this, but you can read your Bible on your phone. There's an app called YouVersion uh, that we highly recommend. You can, you can download that today, but YouVersion and follow along. But you'll find Nehemiah kind of towards the getting towards the middle of the Old Testament, um, looking at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9 through 20 today. And as we've been going through Nehemiah the last couple of weeks, we've noticed a few things that we've seen Nehemiah do as God has given him a vision for something to bring glory to God. Um, first of all, he got a burden, right? And a vision from God is always going to start with a burden. Something you see that you feel like should, is not right. It should be better. People that should be taken care of. This crisis response ministry is a national ministry with the EFCA um, that it started, I've met the guy who started it. It started because he just felt like, man, when there's crisis, things that happen, um, hurricanes, fires, we, wouldn't it be awesome if God's people had a way to kind of be, be uh, sent out and to be... Um, kind of catapulted to that, and they could be organized, and there were some people there to actually show them what needed to be done so that when they got there, they, they could get right to work. <coughs> so he started this. He's just one person that got a vision for this, right? He had a full-time job doing something else, and over time, it just became his, a, a life vision. I've known so many people who have started ministries like that that, that Honestly, it ended up becoming something they had, their whole life was devoted to. And then I've known many who, who started ministries or gotten involved in a ministry that they keep their full-time job. They keep doing what they've always done to raise their uh, income, but they still stay devoted to this vision that God has given them. Um, and others, people who have a vision that is for a season in their life. You know, for five years or ten years, and that's what God calls them to, and then they, they move on. But God wants us to do something with our lives. You know, even if you don't follow Christ, I don't know anyone, I've never met anyone when, that I ask them, like, hey, what do you want to do? Well, you know, I, I, I want to just get up every morning and, and just go to a job and make some money, go home, watch some TV, go to bed, hopefully make enough money to have a fun hobby, Go to bed, on the, go do that on the weekends, and, and die someday. That's what I want to do. I just know, not really met anyone that that's their plan for their life. That's their hope for their life. And yet, quite frankly, that's kind of what a lot of people in America do. And a lot of it is because we don't take the time to, one, get the burden, allow the burden to marinate, you know, and then what did Nehemiah do? The next thing he did was he prayed. He spent time in prayer on that thing. And then he did some preparation in that prayer. And then we saw that he shared the vision, the burden, with the people he needed to share it with in order to make it a reality. And today we're going to see that what, at whatever that vision is, at some point we're going to have to get started. And the first step in really getting started is assessing the work, like getting a picture of the work. I gave you those cards, and last two weeks ago when you took those cards home, I asked you to put those cards someplace and pray about it if you don't have a vision. Now, I know some of you have a vision. You know some things God, something God is calling you to do. In fact, some of you are right in the middle of doing it right now, and that's awesome. Don't write something new down, okay? Keep that on there, right, and, just, and, and use it as a memory uh, for yourself. But some of you don't have that, or you think you know, but you're not sure. And I asked you to put it somewhere um, like on your nightstand or on a, your dashboard or on a mirror so you can keep praying about that as we go through this series and see if God leads you to something. 
And here's what most of you did. Most of you left it on a chair or took it home and left it in your car somewhere. That's what most of you did. So that's why you're getting them again, okay? <laughs> so I'm, I'm giving you, I'm going to keep giving those to you because if you're anything like me, it ended up between the seat of your car and you're going to find it somewhere about November and you're going to go, what was that? Oh, yeah, you're not going to remember. So, so I'm going to keep handing those to you every now and then through this series. <clears throat> but we're called to assess the work and know what we need to do to make things happen. Yeah, God is going to make it happen. But guess what? We're the tools in which he uses. I love the verse, uh, the passage in Luke 14, 8, 28 through 30. Jesus is talking about being a disciple. And he's making it clear to the people that, hey, if you're going to be one of my disciples, there's a cost that comes with it. It doesn't just happen, right? You, you, it's not just, oh, Jesus, I accept you. Cool. I get eternal life. And now I'm just going to live my life. No, he said there's a cost to being a disciple. It means putting your life in my hands. And he gives this analogy, 14, 28 through 30. He says this, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And we've all seen it, right? We've all seen that kind of thing happen in life, right? We've seen people start something and just they just don't have the means to finish it. How many businesses do people start and they just didn't think through that the amount of money it's going to take to really get that business off the ground and then the fact that it's not going to make money for the first year or maybe two years, right? Uh, how many people uh, started building a home? And didn't really think that through. Every time we go to Southern California, we drive, just so we, we were down there last week for a nephew's wedding. And every time we go down, we drive by this place uh, somewhere outside of Baker, if you know Southern California. Baker, Baker is nowhere as it is. And this place is just outside of nowhere. And um, it's, a, it's a water park. That someone decided to build a water park. If you've driven this route, you know exactly where I'm talking about. And, and it's just, you're driving for about 20 miles in a desert, and there's just on the side of a hill, a water park. Well, no longer is there a water park. There's some cement and some little things that look like they used to be for a ride, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and then you drive another 20 miles, and then you get to Lake Baker, which has like 43 people and a cow in it. And, and so, so that's, that's like this whole area. And someone decided, I'm going to build a water park right there. They did not obviously count the cost. They did not really consider and calculate what it was going to take to do this, what it was going to be, take to be sustainable, how much water was going to cost in the desert of Southern California, and how many people were actually going to drive there from nowhere to get there. And, and they built it, and it's just sad. It's just a sad thing because you know you can see what they did had to cost somebody quite a bit of money, and nothing happened with it. We all see it. Well, Nehemiah has spent four months praying about this and preparing, and he is getting ready. I love, there's a guy named Strive, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Strive Masiowa. I have no idea where he's from, but he uh, has a site, it's a uh, Christian businessman site, <clears throat> and he says this, he says, calculating the cost is a, co- is a core business skill. Indeed, let me hasten to even say that it is a core leadership skill. You cannot set up and run a successful enterprise of any kind if you do not know how to calculate the cost. It is something you do at the beginning of the enterprise and then on a daily basis. There are tangible and also intangible costs that you must be aware of all the time. So often, there are very well-meaning people that follow God that want to do something, but they, they've never taken the time to really figure out what it would mean. And if we're going to live out a vision for God, we have to take the time to figure out what does it mean? What does it look like? What are the sacrifices that need to be made? And so now, as Nehemiah is getting ready to start, 
That's the first thing he's going to do. So if you'll join me, we're going to look at verse, start at verse 9 of chapter 2. So it says, Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Samballot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite served, servant heard this, it displeased them greatly and that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of God. Now, I know um, Dana covered this a little bit yesterday, last week. I think our hairs got crossed a little bit on what verse he was supposed to stop on. I just want to real quick mention, because I know some of you weren't here last week, that anytime we're going to do something, we need to expect opposition. No matter what you do, you have to expect that some people are going to oppose it when you do something. This guy, Sam Ballot, he's basically a governor of an area called Samaria. That um, He's under Persian rule, um, but he's from a people group that do not like the Israelites. And so he's, he's, he's opposing them. But there, you're, there's all sorts of reasons that people are going to oppose. One, people don't like change. Simple thing, people don't like change. Some of you, I've mentioned that you might write on your card that God is calling you to raise a godly family. Well, maybe that wasn't, hasn't been your goal for your whole life, and now you've got kids that are 6, 8, 10 years old, 13 years old, and you're now deciding, hey, this is, needs to be important. We're going to raise a godly family. Do you think you're going to face a little opposition when you tell that 13-year-old it's time to get up and go to church on a Sunday morning? Probably going to face a little opposition, right? They're probably not going to... Oh my gosh, I was so waiting for you to say when we were going to start going to church. I've always been wanting to do it. Now, maybe, maybe God's had it on their heart. That, that might be the case. But chances are, you're going to face some opposition. And if we don't take the time to expect that, then we're going to go, ah, oh, well, uh, it's hard now, so never mind. Right? So whatever that is, you're going to face some opposition. People don't like change. When I moved here and we planted the church, received well by many, many people in the community. <laughs> but I had a few people that when I met them, and I would say, hey, I'm Shane. They would just stand here like this and go, mm-hmm. They would not shake my hand. They don't like, some people don't like change. And then there were people that did not want to think about us planting a Christian church here in the valley. And they were willing to oppose that. Last week, Dana mentioned Christians from other churches were opposed when they were planting their church. Um, when we moved here, we had family members that were pretty upset at us that we were moving, especially moving their grandchildren, right, or their nieces and nephews. They didn't care so much that I was moving. They were okay with that, but they wanted them to stay, right? And so they, we had some family members that kind of gave us opposition, gave us pressed us to reconsider if that was really something we should do. And, and a lot of it in well-meaning, but some of it was a little, little jabby, you know? Um, we thought we had support from our home church when we came here. We thought, oh, our, the church that we came from was going to give us great support. Well, that church ended up going through a horrible issue. I'll get, that's a story for a different time. And they had to drop all their support. They didn't, they didn't have... The, the support to give us. Uh, within a year, we, we had a team of about 12 of us. Within the first year, we lost half the team because, they, they, because on paper, one thing sounds good, but then when you start putting it into practice, it doesn't come out the same way in everyone's heads. Right? So there's all sorts of different reasons you're going to get opposition. But I'll tell you, the biggest reason you're going to get opposition to any vision of God Anything you want to do to further God's kingdom? Anything you want to do to make, it, make life better for God's people? To bring glory to God? You're going to get opposition from his enemy. Right? You want, you want an easy Christian life? Here's what you do. Go to church every other week. Keep your Bible somewhere in the house where you can find it after five minutes if you look for it. Pray at most of your meals and live your life. You want an easy Christian life? That's the best way to have an easy Christian life. You want to start facing some opposition from the enemy? Live in such a way that brings glory to God. See, a lot of times as Christians, we think, well, if it's, if it's God's plan, it's all just going to work out. And that is not the way it works. 
In fact, the moment we step into God's plan, that is when we're going to start facing more opposition. We're going to start seeing the enemy at work. In fact, if it's from God, we should expect the greatest opposition. Someone just this yesterday was sharing with me, um, about four months ago, they shared with me a vision they have. That, uh, and, I, and they're the kind of person, when they shared that, I was like, I could see you doing that. You have the means to do it. You have the, the mind and the heart to do that. I can definitely see the passion you have for it. And so we talked about it and been encouraging him to do it. Well, guess what? Yesterday, he comes up to me and starts talking about spiritual warfare he feels like he's in the middle of. And he, he's, he's like, I, at night, he's like I'm, I can't sleep at night. I feel this heaviness. I'm starting to get these really crazy dreams where it feels like I'm being attacked. And he goes, I'm not that person. I don't even, use, like, I usually kind of go, ah, with all that stuff. But, but it's, it's, it's heavy on me. And I said, I believe, sure, I, absolutely. That's probably what's going on. So let's start praying about it. Right? So w- the more we move in to God's vision for our lives, the more we're going to face some opposition, which is why we were supposed to do that first step, bathe it in prayer, right? Now, there's a different side to this. I keep finding every time I go through this, there's, there's two types of people, right? There, the other side is some pe- there are some people that expect opposition, And they kind of almost are the type of people that actually go looking for it, right? So on the other side, yes, don't be the person that expects opposition so much that you're just like, well, people are going to oppose it. You don't like it. Here's the way it is, you know? Don't be that, (laughs) right? The, The goal, if it's something from God, try to win over as many people as possible into it. Don't be a purposely abrasive person and just go, well, see, this is God telling me. All these people don't, you know, that's, I've known people like that, okay? Don't be that, Okay, <clears throat> but let's move on. Let's look, at, let's look at this assessing aspect. Verse 11, I'm not going to read all this, but um, so Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem, and he's there for three days. And if you look at verse 12, he says he doesn't tell anyone what God had told him to do, right? So he doesn't just walk in and go, people, you're in luck. God has finally sent you me to deal with your problems that you haven't been able to deal with, right? He doesn't just walk in and do that. Right? He goes in, he's there for three days, and, the, and then it says after three days, verse 13, he goes down and he inspects the walls. He does a full inspection of the condition of the walls and figures out what needs to be done. He assessed the scope of the work. We have to assess the scope of the work. One of the biggest reasons things fail is that no one takes the time to really consider the cost before they start. In Luke 14, that word, um, the version I read out of the ESV uses the word count. But the word is probably the most literal word is consider. And then there's two ways that consider seems to be used. It, t- there's count, but then there's calculate. And I actually like that, that side of the, the calculate because there's a difference between consi- counting the cost and calculating the cost in my mind. So let me give you an example. When we go out to eat or when I go, we go to grocery shopping, one of my favorite things to do is play the guess the bill game, right? Anyone do that, right? right? You just estimate like, okay, well, you had to do uh, these, these the average meal was this much, blah, 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 drinks, okay. And you just, you got like 30 seconds, everyone name a price, whoever's closest, right? They, they win. And then you just get to say you're better than everyone. So, um, so, <laughs> so, and I'm usually pretty good at that. I can usually be within a couple bucks, right? But there's a difference between that and calculating the cost, right? Calculating would be like, hey, we want to know to the penny what this costs. And that would be we go through and we add it all up and we go, okay, this is what it's going to cost, right? I don't want my waitress to do what I did. I don't want her to go, well, it's about this. Here's your bill. I, I want her to calculate it, or somebody, the machine, to calculate it, right? I want to know exactly what my bill is. I don't want someone just guesstimating, right? Because sometimes I'm quite a bit off, right? So we want to calculate it. We really want to consider at a deeper level what it means 
to do the things that we believe God is calling us to do. Take some time to do that. I, you know, I mean, I see it all the time. People with vacations or just going to a nice dinner or Christmas. Christmas is the one that gets Tanya and I, right, every year. Well, we're going to spend this much on all these people, you know, for our kids, different family members, friends. Okay, we've got to get a Christmas tree. We'll do this. this. Okay, it's going to be Christmas is going to cost us this much. And then a week after Christmas when I'm going through and trying to figure out everything, I'm like, wait, Christmas did not cost us this much. <laughs> Christmas cost us this much. What happened? Right? The, what happened was we didn't really consider. We, we estimated. We, can, we counted it up a little bit. But, it, but it, it, it wasn't what we thought it would be. Maybe you're writing on that card, raising a godly family. I keep going back to this. I know, but I know a lot of us are in that stage where it's a key thing. Maybe you wrote on your card that God wants you to raise a godly family. Well, have you considered what that means? Have you considered what it really means to do that? Have you considered how you're going to deal with the negative influences? Have you considered um, how you're going to instill godly character in your children? Have you considered how you're teaching God's word? Are you considering how you're teaching your children to love people? Are you just like, well, here, God, I want to raise godly family. Okay, um, I'm going to buy them a Bible, and I'm going to drop them off at, with Michelle and Spud for an hour and a half a week, and hopefully that will all work out, right? Is that your plan? Because guess what? It's probably not going to work. That's not a good plan, right? Nothing against Spud and Michelle, but that's not a good plan. Just like if your only plan to, to be a godly person is to say, well, I'm going to go to church once a week when it works out, right? That's, that's not a good plan. Uh, You've you got to consider what it really means to have that vision. How are you going to instill a vision of your children in your children for them to see the world through God's eyes? How are you going to do that? You know one of the things, I actually, if you came to our missions dinner, which, by the way, be praying. Our missions team is getting ready to go to Honduras. We leave March 12th. Very excited about that. But we had our missions dinner. had a great showing for that <coughs> this Friday. Um, but one thing I um, always share in there is I believe it's so great for us to take our kids on mission trips. And here's my reason why. I hear this all the time, especially when I was a youth pastor. Man, my kid, are just, they're just so selfish, and I, and I don't get why they, why they just don't get. Like, they have it so good. And, and I tell them all the time, do you have any idea how it is around the rest of the world? No, they have the slightest clue. Why? Because you protect them from it all the time. Right? How in the world are they going to know that they have it so good? Because you gave it all to them. They don't know. And then they surround themselves with other kids who have it just as good, if not better. So how in the world are they ever supposed to know that, no, this is not life for most people. I am a super privileged individual. Because we don't show them. Right? Right? It's, it's, so if we want to raise a godly family, if that's our vision, man, we've got to take that serious. That's not just something that, that just is going to happen. But the bigger the scope of the vision, the more that needs to be considered, the more costs that need to be calculated. I just saw the movie King Richard. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. Um, King Richard is about the, the dad of Venus and Serena Williams. And I love it because... King Richard, when you think about this, okay, he, he lived, um, I want, want to say um, they lived in Compton. They lived in Compton, and, you know, he is in no way any different from the average lower, lower middle class or, or even considered uh, poor black family in Compton. No different. Had no different education, no better, had all the same past stuff, all that, all that stuff. But King Richard, right on, Richard Williams, I guess is his actual name. Richard Williams, I'm not going to call him King Richard. They did. But <laughs> Richard Williams had a vision for his kids. And you, I've read, I, since the movie, I read interviews from his daughters, and they will both say this would not have happened if it weren't for our parents. And he never played tennis, 
but decided his daughters were going to. And he, you know, and it, but he didn't just buy them rackets and go, all right, get out there and do it. No, he, he took them and he practiced with them for an hour and a half to two hours every day. And then would help them with their homework to make sure they were still getting the good grades. And then on his off time as a, as a dad, he would, he would go around to tennis coaches and try to persuade people to, to come and coach his daughters. And he got met with many, many different brick walls and finally find someone to, to do that. And, and to coach them. But even then, he didn't want his girls to be burned out and hate it. So he didn't let them start competing at a, at a high level until they got older. Because he, he, didn't, he saw all these other kids burn out. And so he protected them from that. And he still made sure they got to have fun. He put a lot of work into it. And the girls are two arguably of the greatest tennis players to ever play the game. But he understood and he considered the cost. Unfortunately, sometimes when it comes to faith issues, we think it's bold to just take big, uninformed steps. We think, well, that's just I'm, just, I'm just walking in faith. You know, yeah, Peter walked on water, but do you know who was literally standing right in front of him? He was looking him in the eye when he did it. Jesus was literally looking him in the eye. And maybe you've had Jesus look you in the eye. I'm not going to discount your spiritual experience, but I've never just had Jesus seven feet in front of me look him in the eye. So until I do, man, I'm going I'm to take some time to really think through the steps and really seek what God is really calling us to do. It's not bold or smart to take uninformed action steps. And it doesn't show a lack of faith to ask difficult questions. And to surround ourselves with people that will help us ask difficult questions. I've seen a lot of people cause more damage than good by jumping into stuff without taking the time to research the tough questions. Start a ministry without taking time to think through, do I really have the resources to do this? Do I really have the time? Am I the kind of personality that, that should do this? Um, and to get confirmation from all the people, from people around you and to do those kinds of things. We oftentimes avoid the people who ask us the tough questions. See, that's why churches have boards, right? A church is supposed to have a, an elder board to, to make sure that it's not just one or even two people making decisions. It's, it's a group of people that, that ask tough questions and, and put stuff through the ringer a little bit, and, and they come through in love to decisions together. No matter how much you research, though, you're going to make mistakes. Man, if I could list all the mistakes we've made in this church, we'd be here for a couple days. All right? And yet God still works. God will still work. He'll still use you. Now, there's the other side of that, though, right? Yeah, we got a plan, but don't get so preoccupied planning that you never move forward. You perfectionist in the room, Right? I'm, I just got to have everything worked out. At some point, you still have to move forward. Some people, there are those people on the other side, they want every question answered rather than trusting God to ever move. And sometimes we need to move. Sometimes we need to start, start small. You know, God's, you think God's calling you to feed the hungry? Start small. Make, a, make an extra sandwich on your way to work every day, and, and maybe there's a homeless person that stands on a corner. Start small. Do something. All right. <clears throat> well, he, we get to verse 17. He's assessed the work. But there's actually two things I'm, we're going to look at real quick in this. Look at what he says in 17. He's taught, he, now it's time he's talking to the people. And he says, you see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And verse 18 is where I really want to look at. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And then jump down to 20, and look at 20. Um, he's fa that, that Sam Ballot guy. You're going to see Sam Ballot through all the whole thing. I'm not doing Dana's voice, though, if you are here last week. I ain't doing Tobiah. Um, although, I will say it was funny when I watched that, because I'm like, I actually think the exact same thing. I always picture him as that little side guy. Anyway, um, but uh, 
Um, verse 20, and in replying to them, he says, the God of heaven will make us prosper as we, his servants, will arise and build. Here's an important point. And I said this in the, the first week, but I'm going to bring this up every now and then. We always have to remember who it's for. We need to remember who it's for. It's never for us. It's for God. See, Nehemiah knew that while this vision was going to benefit God's people, it wasn't for them. It was for the glory of God. Everything we do is for the glory of God. If you're struggling with your kids right now and, and you're struggling with this, trying to keep your family focused on, on living a godly life and, and raising your kids in a manner that honors God, and that's your vision, well, well, keep remembering, it's, it's not for you, it's not even for your kids, it's for God's honor, because that will keep you pressing forward. That will keep you pressing forward, because guess what? If it's not for them, guess what? They might not live out the life you want. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to be faithful in what God called you to, and remember you were doing it for him. And he's got the plan. Remember who we're serving. Nehemiah was keenly aware that the task before them was too big for them to accomplish on their own. It was only through God's power that they were going to accomplish this. Real quick, if you remember that Moses and, Nehemiah, uh, Moses and um, Joshua, they both were... To, to enter the promised land. Moses was supposed to lead them right after the crossing the Red Sea into the promised land. So they send spies, right? They send spies in the promised land. So what do, the, what do the spies do? They go to the promised land and they look at it through their eyes and they assess it, the work based on just their power. Maybe these guys are bigger than us. They're, there's more of them than us. Their walls are too strong and they come back and they're like, we can't do this. We can't do this. Joshua's people, they see it, this isn't for us, this is for God. And if it's for God, it's tough. But we're looking at, is this, do we have a confirmation for God, from God? They come back, see the exact same things, but say, yeah, this is what God wants. There's a difference. If we see it for God, it changes things. It changes our vision. But the other thing about this I want you to see real quick this isn't in your notes, but you, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The bigger the vision, the more people we need to include. Look at what he says. He says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem. Notice he doesn't say, come, help me build this wall. Let us do it. We're, we're all going to work together. We're all in this together. And then look at their answer. Let us, verse 18, let us rise up and build. They all worked in it together. The bigger the vision, the more people it takes. Next week, we're going to look at the, the work they did, and we're going to see that it took everybody. <coughs> and next week, we're going to start really pressing um, and encouraging you to really consider, are you us? Are you a part, are you an us with MBF? Not a, not a you guys when you talk about the church, but a us when you talk about MBF church. Are you with us in this vision that God's given us in reaching this valley and being a, an impact in this valley? Because that's why that building was built. It was, it's, it was built so that we can be, have a greater impact in this valley. You know, it's going to be awesome. We, we're going to have more room for kids' ministry. We're going to triple our space for kids' ministry. That is awesome. You know what that means? It means we need triple the leaders in kids' ministry. We need, we need triple the workers. If we're going to separate them, right? Unless you guys just want us to separate them and leave them in here by themselves, we can do that. You know, it's on you. Um, Right? But we're going to need, we're gonna need more, more people doing kids' ministry. We got two sets of doors that people can come through. We want people to be greeted and welcomed at both of them. Weird, I know. Right? Well, so, so we're going to need 
more greeters. We, we um, have, are gonna have a cafe. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so cool. You guys are going to be able to get like even like espresso maybe sometimes or wet muffin, whatever. But that would mean we're going to need another person helping. We can't have one person doing all that at each service. We estimate that we have between 25 to 30 volunteers on a given Sunday, every Sunday. We didn't double that. Are you and us? Are you going to rise up with us? Because that's what, we, that's what it's going to take. So next week we're going to hit on that. Okay? And I say that because maybe your God is calling me to is pretty small right now. Maybe it's God is calling me to serve every Sunday. You know, we do have two services. It's kind of cool. You can serve in one and then go to another one. It's awesome. Um, but maybe that's what God's calling you to. To rise up with us. I'll close with this. In a world in which we want results and we want them now, we got to remember that God doesn't work or move in our timing. He wants to do big things to us. But they don't come quickly and they don't come easily. They come with opposition. They come with criticisms. They come with hard work. They come with taking the time to assess what needs to be done and how. And asking hard questions and getting a good understanding of what needs to be done. And then bringing other people in on that vision. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are a God of vision. I look around me at the vision you had in creation and the beauty that we get to experience and be a part of. God, I, I am in awe and humbled by the vision you had for this church and how it, there was no way it was ever going to be done with one person or a couple people. I thank you for those who have made sacrifices and given and, and been done lots and lots of work, oftentimes never being noticed, to make this vision a reality. We thank you for the blessing of it. We thank you for the people it's impacted and the, the ways it's brought you, you glory in this valley. And we pray that this be just the beginning of what brings you glory here in Hebrew. In Jesus' name, amen.